Hi, everybody. My name is Dr. Kerry Krieger. I am the founder and executive director of Save the Frogs, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting amphibians. We do work in California, across the USA, and all around the world to protect amphibians. And this class that's happening right now is part of Save the Frogs Academy. Save the Frogs Academy offers free online classes on a wide variety of topics related to amphibian and environmental conservation twice a week, every Sunday at 5 p.m. California time and every Wednesday at 11 a.m. California time. If you are interested in protecting amphibians and especially if you are pursuing a career related to amphibian or environmental conservation, then I strongly encourage you to uh, attend as many of these classes as possible. All the classes get recorded and we put the videos up to our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash save the frog. So if you want to see this class afterwards or if you miss a class, you can almost always find the class on our YouTube channel. Today we're going to be talking about chytrid fungus, which was the focus of my PhD research. I spent four years in Australia from 2003 to 2007 doing research on chytridiomycosis, which is causing a lot of problems for frogs all around the world. And so today we've got a few things happening. I will be telling you all about, I'm going to give a brief overview of the chytrid fungus and then talk specifically about my research and the results of my research from my time in Australia. And we also have Susan Jewell from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service who deals with Lacey Act issues, and she'll tell you what that means and how it relates to the chytrid fungus and amphibians. And we will also have a few comments from Jonathan Colby, who has done some work with uh, wildlife that's being imported into the USA, specifically with regards to the diseases that they may carry. So I'm just going to start out with a very brief intro to chytrid, and then we will get going, um, or sorry, I'll, I will turn it over to Susan to talk to you about the Lacey Act. And if you have any questions during this, please chat them in to me, and we will take uh, a few minutes on a few different occasions to answer those questions. And possibly if we have time at the end, I can unmute people if they have a microphone and want to ask a live question. But for now, best thing is just chat in your question. Okay, so to begin with, just a quick background on what's going on with amphibians around the world. There have been rapid, generally unexplained population declines and extinctions that have occurred worldwide. So before 1993 or so, uh, definitely before 1989, there were not a lot of people out looking at what was happening to the amphibians. So if, if a population disappears now, perhaps there's been someone watching it and we can get right to um, figuring out what caused it. But a lot of these rapid declines happened. Nobody was watching. So, um, cr you know, it's just our best guess based on um, data that we can acquire now as to what happened to those frog populations. At least one third of amphibian species are threatened with extinction. They're uh, the most threatened vertebrate group in the world. And what's interesting is that a lot of the declines and disappearances worldwide have happened in supposedly pristine protected areas such as national parks and preserves. Where I did most of my PhD research in Queensland, Australia, at least six frog species went extinct in the past few decades. And all around the world, a lot of these unexplained population declines are generally restricted to high altitude stream dwellers. So that's amphibians that live in the mountains in stream areas. And the main causes of amphibian declines that we know of are invasive species, non-native species, over harvesting, which means taking amphibians out of the wild, altering and destroying habitat that amphibians depend on, 
climate change, global warming, contaminants, pesticides, pollute, pollution, and emerging infectious diseases, which means infectious diseases that um, have significantly increased in prevalence or uh, their effect on amphibians. And a lot of these threats to frogs are happening at the same time, which means you can get synergistic effects, which means that the final outcome is greater than the sum of the individual parts. So chytridiomycosis is a potentially lethal skin disease of amphibians caused by the chytrid fungus, Batrachochytrium dendrobotitis. And it's known to infect at least 380 species of amphibians around the world. And it's been demonstrated to be responsible for mass mortalities, population declines, and species extinctions on multiple continents. And in terms of biodiversity, which is the number of species there are, it's the most significant disease of vertebrates in recorded history. So that goes for humans as well. It's caused more damage than any human disease. It's caused more damage to wildlife populations than uh, any disease that we know of. And some specifics from Australia, it's likely responsible for declines in at least 14 species, possibly seven complete species extinctions. And something I've always found interesting, the earliest record of chytrid in Australia. So we did not know that chytrid existed until about 1997 or 98 when scientists identified it, but it was causing problems for a long time before that. And if we look at museum specimens that were collected before that time, we can find chytrid. So from those specimens, the earliest record of chytrid in Australia is from Southeast Queensland, which is where I was based doing my PhD, and specifically in the Conondale Black Hall Mountain Ranges. And that frog was collected in December of 1978. And the last sighting of the southern day frog, Todactylus diurnus, was only one month later, January 1979. Last sighting of the southern gastric brooding frog, Rheobotrachus silus, September 1981. Both of those frog species lived almost exclusively in those mountain ranges where chytrid was first found. And also the last known Todactylus acuti rostris was in a laboratory where it died of chytridiomycosis. So we know that chytrid can cause significant problems in Australia and worldwide. So right now what I'm going to do is switch it over to our panelist, uh, Susan Jewell. So uh, please hold out one second while we get her on the line. Susan, are you there? I'm on the line. Um, are you giving me presenter status? Yes, you should have that coming over to you. Okay, um, let's see. So you, feel, feel free to introduce yourself once you get your screen going. I'll let you know when I can see it. Uh, okay, do you see my screen now? I don't see it yet. Let's see if it takes a second. Okay, yes. You see it, okay. All right. Well, uh, good morning and good afternoon, depending upon where you are. I would like to say hello to everybody and thank Carrie for inviting me to give you this summary of what the Fish and Wildlife Service is doing regarding chytrid in amphibians. Uh, this is not all inclusive. Um, we have about 8,000 employees in the Fish and Wildlife Service. I'll mostly be talking about my role in this and a little bit about uh, some of the other things we're doing. I work on injurious wildlife and we received a petition regarding the listing of amphibians as injurious and I'll explain more about that petition but first I'll explain briefly what injurious wildlife listing is. Um, okay and sorry I'm trying to scroll down. Okay there we go. 
Um, and sorry, my phone is going off. Okay, so injurious wildlife, um, you can see on the screen, uh, you'll see how Congress describes what injurious wildlife is. It's wildlife found through regulation or congressional action to be injurious to the interests of human beings, agriculture, horticulture, forestry, wildlife, or wildlife resources of the United States. Susan. There are letters underneath that uh, you can see that it says Lacey Act, uh, which is 18 U.S. Code. And Congress passed the Lacey Act in 1900. And um, somebody's telling me that the screen is not advancing. That's correct. It's not advancing. Okay. Um, uh, I, I see it on my screen. Um, you may have it on paused. There should be a control that says show your screen and maybe you can hit play on that. Okay. Um, let's see. Yes, it's going. Okay. So, so right now we're on the what is injurious wildlife? Do you see that? Yes. Okay. Uh, I apologize. Um, Sorry. Okay. So, so Congress passed the Lacey Act in 1900. It was the first major national conservation legislation in the United States. The Lacey Act established prohibitions against certain species, thereafter called injurious species. Injurious wildlife are generally invasive species, but they may be injurious for other reasons. For example, we listed all members of the salmon family, salmon as in the fish salmon, as injurious because they are hosts to certain serious fish diseases that are highly contagious. Now, of course, the salmon aren't invasive. They're um, native and quite an integral part of our environment. But it's the disease that they carry that the host, the salmon, injurious. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because this is a precedent that was used for the petition that I mentioned I will be talking more about. So um, injurious means that it has to cause harm. So um, a little bit more about the Lacey Act. There are two sections of the Lacey Act. You've probably heard of the Lacey Act somewhere along the line. It makes the news quite often. Mostly the part of the Lacey Act that we hear on the news has to do with a different section, not the injurious wildlife section. So there's a section here on the upper part of the slide that says Title 16. And parentheses I put broad because it really is broad. It has to do with assistance with, with the Fish and Wildlife being able to give assistance to states with intercepting illegal importation and interstate transport of wildlife species and plants taken or possessed in violation of state, federal, tribal, or foreign laws. So this can include uh, species that are protected by state, federal, tribal, or foreign laws, prohibited. They can be uh, protected under Endangered Species Act, Migratory Bird Species Act, or it could be prohibited under the other part of the Lacey Act. Um, it could be plants, which injurious wildlife is not about. They could be parts of wildlife, parts of plants. So, so it's very broad. Um, the part that I work under is this lower part, Title 18, which is specific to injurious wildlife and any species that is designated by us or by Congress as injurious wildlife would then be prohibited from importation into the United States or transportation across state lines. So, and injurious wildlife is what I work under. I guess I already mentioned that. So, and a couple more things about Title 18, which is injurious wildlife. Uh, the top section under prohibited, Again, it's importation and interstate transportation that would be prohibited of something listed as injurious. And then the blue highlight says that 
uh, importation and interstate transport of dead animals are not specifically prohibited unless we state it. And in parentheses it says uneviscerated salmonids. And as I mentioned before, the salmon that are um, can, can carry certain infectious diseases that are uh, deadly to other fish, uh, they need to have a health certificate uh, in, in transport with them in order to be um, imported into the United States. Now this is if they're alive or even if they're dead as long as they're whole. If, they're, if they are eviscerated or their guts are cut out, the guts are what carries the, uh, the viruses, um, then they don't need the certificate. And again, I'm mentioning this because this is the basis of the petition that we received. So there are certain exceptions. Um, permits may be given for zoological, educational, medical, and scientific purposes. And I uh, just want to let people know that even if something is listed as injurious, you're still allowed to possess them, sell them, use them, breed them, whatever, as long as it's within the state that it's, it was existing when the regulation was passed. So, okay, so what can we list as injurious? Uh, we can list wild mammals and wild birds, not domesticated or agricultural ones. We can list any kind of fish, any kind of reptile, any kind of amphibian or mollusk or crustacean. Uh, we can't list other types of invertebrates. We can't list plants. We have not so far listed any amphibians. Uh, the most recent listing that we've had, as you see in the photo, was the Burmese python and three other species of large constrictor snakes, and that was about a year and a half ago in uh, January 2012. Um, so now for the petition. In 2009, actually um, four years ago, almost to the day, we received a petition from the Defenders of Wildlife and it was also, the same petition was also sent to the Department of Agriculture, uh, but this petition that we received was to list all amphibians in trade as injurious unless free of Trachochytrium dendrobotitis. And the responsibility for the appropriate action of this petition was assigned to my office. So the defenders of wildlife were concerned that unregulated trade which usually came from pet industry, uh, live animals for consumption, uh, and you know probably you know medical research and other things continues to threaten the survival of many native amphibian species, including species listed by the Fish and Wildlife Service under the Endangered Species Act. So they saw this as a, a possible way of um, restricting the spread of chytrid fungus. Now, on your slide, hopefully you'll see um, it's actually quite a bit of writing. You don't need to read the whole thing. This was taken verbatim from the petition, and it's showing how the defenders asked us to change our regulation to state that all amphibians would be injurious unless they were accompanied by a health certificate saying that they were free of BD. And so they kind of uh, explained to us exactly, you know, the petition actually was extremely well written. I've got to say, I used to work in endangered species and I saw a lot of really poor petitions. This one was so well done. It was really uh, a pleasure to read. Um, and they went so far as explaining to us exactly how we could change the regulation. Um, so, so what did we do as a result of that? Uh, a year later, in September of 2010, uh, on the first bullet you can see, we published a notice of inquiry in the Federal Register. Now that notice of inquiry was telling the public that we received the petition and that we were looking for more information. A notice of inquiry is something that an agency can do before it publishes a proposed rule if it's looking for more information. If an agency has all the information it needs, it could go ahead and just publish a proposed rule. In our case, we knew that there was a lot of complexities to this issue. So we put out a 90-day comment period and we received 
about 450 public comments. To review the comments, we enlisted the assistance of Dr. Angela Pico, an expert on diseases of amphibians and trade. And she works for the Fish and Wildlife Service in our Sacramento Regional Office. Now she works in endangered species. The comments, as she realized, re revealed how much more complicated the whole issue is than is clear from the petition. So um, just to give you some examples of how complex this is, if we were to follow the petition, we would have to list the entire class amphibia as injurious. Now, I don't know what the exact tally is of worldwide the number of amphibians. It's at least 6,000, maybe 7,000 species of amphibians. I'm sure Kerry has a better number off the top of his head. But this would be unprecedented for the Fish and Wildlife Service to list something with this many species. Uh, so some of the complications are all the species carriers. You know, Carrie mentioned in the beginning that uh, so far at least 380 species are known to uh, be infected by BD. Would we want to list all of them not knowing whether they actually could carry? Um, how would we test um, a shipment? Let's say somebody was importing a shipment in from another country. Would every individual need to be tested and certified? or just a sample, how soon before the shipment would they need to be tested? Are there standardized tests for this? What about um, could the BD be picked up during transport? Maybe it left another country or another state completely clean and somehow in transport it picked it up. What about um, fish being shipped uh, from aquaculture and there was a frog, there was a tadpole in the pond that kind of hitchhiked a ride. Uh, what would happen to that shipment of fish? So uh, th there are, I could go into a whole lot more complications. Basically, uh, the comment period opened up, I would say, more questions than it answered for us. Um, so we're looking at some alternatives. Um, and we've also been working with uh, Jonathan Colby, who used to work for the Fish and Wildlife Service, and we hope someday will come back to us. He's now uh, at the uh, James Cook University in Australia working on his PhD, and he's been doing work going to various ports and swabbing for BD uh, at ports of entry and uh, also, I think, in other countries uh, before they're exported to the United States, and he's going to be talking more about that later, so I won't go into that. Um, so. We're, we're trying to collect more data. Uh, I wish I could say we've made more progress, but uh, it's such a complex issue that, um, and we have other things that we're working on. Unfortunately, that's all the progress that we made. So um, uh, I will say that a listing could help. Uh, we know that there are some strains that are probably not here in the United States. And if they do get here, they could be more virulent than the ones in the United States. So uh, there are ways that a listing could help. Um, and so uh, very quickly, a few things about what other Fish and Wildlife Service people are doing. Um, Angela told me that uh, they are working on some endangered species listings. There are three frogs that were uh, uh, proposed for listing um, recently, let's see, that was in April. Uh, the Sierra Nevada yellow-legged frog is proposed to be listed as endangered. Northern uh, distinct population segment of the mountain yellow frog proposed to be endangered. And Yosemite toad proposed for threatened status. And the two biggest threats are uh, disease, namely BD, and trout stocking. Uh, so we are looking, you know, at BD through Endangered Species Act. Um, and there was a study done a few years ago through our National Wildlife Refuge System on um, abnormal amphibians. And this could be from a number of reasons, pesticides for one. Uh, they weren't specifically looking for BD, but there were uh, I, I guess some of our people in California took some swabs 
and we're working with the U.S. Geological Survey um, on BD. And if you also contact um, USGS, they are doing some work on BD. The um, Amphibian and Reptile Monitoring Initiative under USGS uh, probably can help you with more. Leanne Ball is their coordinator. Uh, so that about sums it up for what we're doing. I just want to wrap up with a few things that I'd like to ask of people who are listening. If you raise or trade amphibians, please consider selecting ones with the lowest risk of becoming invasive or injurious. A little research on some websites, the USGS has a website, um, and there are some other ones um, I can forward to Carrie later. Uh, kind of cumbersome to give over the, um, this webinar, but uh, a little bit of research, and you could find out which ones are likely to become invasive, and if possible, try to avoid um, keeping those as pets or recommending those as pets. If you own an amphibian, be a responsible pet owner by keeping your conditions clean. Don't dump the water outside, um, various things like that. And um, please don't release unwanted pets into the wild. I can't stress that enough. I know some people think they're doing a good thing and letting their animal go, but um, it causes all kinds of problems for one spread of disease for another. The animal probably won't survive, but it also could become invasive. So um, I also want to let you know that the Fish and Wildlife Service is a partner with this campaign called Habitatitude. And uh, this campaign helps to prevent releasing plants and animals into aquatic environments. So um, that's all I have. So thank you for being a part of the solution to help us protect our amphibians. Hey, thanks a lot. With that. Thanks, Susan. Uh, can you turn over the controls to me, please? Uh, yes. Um, presenter. Uh, I think I can do it here. You should have it now. Got it. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So thanks a lot, Susan. Now um, we're going to turn it over briefly to Jonathan Colby for um, five minutes maximum to tell us about his work with the wildlife trade and importations into the U.S. So I'm going to unmute you, Jonathan, and you are on the line. How's it going? Good. How are you? Thanks for having me. Excellent. So you're calling in from Australia, is that right? Um, I'm actually in New Jersey at the moment before okay. going back to Australia, yes. Okay, so why don't you tell us about some of your experiences? <laughs> okay, so I'm currently a PhD student at James Cook University in Australia. Um, as Sue said, I was previously employed with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as a wildlife inspector, uh, regulating the international wildlife trade. Um, and currently, I'm interested in the role international wildlife trade has in the potential spread of wildlife diseases, uh, especially chytrid fungus at the moment. Um, so to add on to what Susan was already saying, basically what I've been doing for the past year and a half, um, which I'm still in the middle of right now, is trying to evaluate um, the, the number and frequency of animals that are imported that are infected with chytrid fungus and how that may relate to this injurious species petition submitted by Defenders of Wildlife. Um, so I'm, I'm, as we all know, it makes a lot of sense that amphibians are obviously infected with chytrid that are being imported and exported. Um, but I think what is really significant in this issue when you start talking about policy is, scientifically speaking, how great is the risk and how can we quantify that to feed into policies? Um, so I've been sampling animals directly upon importation with, with uh, cooperation from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to say, you know, if you wanted to quantify how many amphibians are actually infected when they touch the ground, you know, what is the tangible risk that that poses? And how can you predict if a shipment is infected? Um, how often does it happen? And are there certain things associated with those shipments that could increase or decrease the risk? You know, are there ways that we could clean up the trade and or regulate it to, you know, protect 
global health. Um, so I've been going to airports, I've been swabbing amphibians, I've also been swabbing their enclosures. Um, so for example, bullfrog shipments, I'm equally concerned with things like the cardboard cartons that they're shipped in um, for disposal. Um, we know that chytrid can have a long persistence in the environment outside of a host, so the boxes could be potentially infectious. Um, the same goes for water that some of these shipments are shipped in. What happens to these bags of water after they're discarded? Um, and just to briefly summarize, what I've been finding is that there is certainly a lot of infected animals being traded. Um, it's very variable between species and between shipments. Um, so as Susan alluded to, it is a very complex situation. Um, so although it does seem that some degree of regulation may be warranted, um, it's very difficult at the moment to determine what sort of regulation and how to target that in a, in a way that it's justified and it'll be accepted. Um, because trade is a very difficult thing to generalize. You know, it's, there, it's hard to predict what species are going to come in tomorrow. We know what came in yesterday. Um, and it's hard to predict um, just a, a changing creature like trade. Um, but that's something I'm very interested in and working with Susan and, and Fish and Wildlife to do, um, as well as my collaborators at EcoHealth Alliance. Um, we, we collectively feel that sampling within the international wildlife trade is a very important issue right now to, to form a marriage between science and policy and, and create this objective database of information that can be used for policies to protect biodiversity and global health altogether. Um, yeah, so that's my very general summary of a very complicated situation. Thanks, Jonathan. Can, let me ask you one question. Uh, just an approximate answer, what percentage, what's the prevalence of the, if you take the total of mm -hmm. all your samples, what percent are positive for chytrid, for, um, chytrid fungus or for just amphibian diseases in general? Um, I could say, you know, maybe 20%, 30%, 40%, but I feel that's an unfair call for me to make because it, I know that it varies so much between species. So okay. it really depends the subdivision of how many species I'm talking about. You know, one species I might have found zero infected, another I might have found 100. So if I told you, you know, 50% were infected, that's kind of skewing either species. But it's, it's not as high as I personally expected, but it's high enough to cause alarm. Um, and, and there is this variation between shipments that I cannot yet explain, where some shipments are very high and others very low in the same species. So I am continuing this work now to be able to make some generalizations and say, well, overall, is it going to be a high prevalence or a low prevalence, or is it only from certain countries or certain species? Okay. Um, and how many countries would you guess have had positive shipments? One single individual coming in positive from has happened from about how many countries? So far, I've looked fairly well at about four countries and all of them. Okay. Um, Are you able to tell those... us which countries? <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So for and 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 that's another thing I want to mention the. the the way that I'm doing these studies, it is objective. It's not randomly looking at countries and species that are just whatever's there. I'm looking at things that are either high source volumes or high traded species so that the results have a lot of weight in the global trade. So for example, Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a very big part of the sampling because that's you know number one or two of the source of a lot of our exotic species. And yes, there was a lot of kitchen there. Um, same with um, bullfrogs from Dominican Republic were very infected. Um, yeah, and I will also mention I've also been sampling for ronavirus. So kind of the hidden danger behind chytrid is now we have ronavirus up and coming to make it even worse. Um, and, and we're also looking at that and finding a lot of ronavirus. Okay, and what's the, what's the destination of these animals? Is this primarily for frog legs, for pets, for bait, for laboratories, for zoos? What would you guess? Uh, the majority, it's about 50-50. About half of it is about for frog legs, and the other half is for exotics for the pet trade. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's split. Okay. Thanks. All right. Thank but you. But they both so got lots of stuff. Yeah. Okay. All right. So to clarify that, both frogs destined for the pet trade and frogs destined for the frog legs trade were tested positive for chytrid fungus and even ronavirus. Is that a true statement? Yes. Okay, thank you very much.
Thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you. No problem. All right. So I'm going to see we have a, uh, let's see, Peter, if you are out there and you would like to talk, then please raise your hand and I can unmute you. And otherwise, I will continue with my presentation. Okay, looks like, okay, so um, I'm glad that Susan and Jonathan could give their input. So I'm going to give my input into what I just heard, which was all brand or essentially brand new information to me. What I just heard was that there's a lot of amphibians being shipped into the United States. And there's a lot of disease that's found, perhaps as high as 30 percent of animals being infected with chytrid fungus. And as Jonathan said, it varies between species. It varies between shipment and co country and the company. But from my professional experience and just from using logic, knowing that humans ship about 100 million amphibians around the world intercontinentally each year, and knowing that chytridiomycosis, one of many amphibian diseases, can cause complete extinction of tens, maybe hundreds of amphibian species, the risk from allowing any single amphibian into the United States for non-essential purposes is huge. So we heard, uh, you know, there are complexities, but my question is, you know, we can come up with all kinds of questions about the info that we learn from studying amphibian diseases and the questions that were raised by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. My question is, what type of trade, what reason would we be importing amphibians into the United States that validates the possibility of driving entire amphibian species to complete extinction. I'm not sure what reason we have that's so important that we need those amphibians coming into the United States that we're willing to have American amphibian species driven to complete extinction or even to drastic population decline. And to think that we know enough about amphibian and their diseases, to think that we can just somehow choose which species or which shipments or which countries or companies have perfect, perfectly healthy amphibians that will never cause any trouble when there's so few people studying amphibian diseases and so f compared to the 100 million amphibians that are being shipped around the world, when there's new diseases being found all the time, as we heard, it's not just chytrid fungus. There's, we have a page on rhinoviruses here. And as we found out about a week ago when a published scientific paper came out of the Netherlands describing a second form of Batrachochytrium, Batrachochytrium salamandrivorans that specifically infects salamanders that we didn't even know about until a week ago, or those scientists maybe within the past year or two found out about it. There's so many diseases that cause such huge problems for amphibians. It's impossible. It's just crazy to me to think that we're going to, um, as a society, condone the shipment of amphibians all around the world, knowing that it's inevitable. If we do the math, 100 million per year times 10 years, times 100 years, for the next 1,000 years, we think we can ship hundreds of millions, billions of amphibians around the world and their diseases will not cause the complete extinction of species. I, I don't see that as being a possibility. The, the way I see it, if you look at our history of knowledge of amphibian diseases, what they've done to amphibians, look at the numbers of how many we're shipping, look at how many countries have regulations, which is only Australia and New Zealand, to my knowledge, have regulations for chytrid fungus, then you know we're just we're asking for amphibians to be driven to extinction if we keep doing what we're doing. So maintaining the status quo 
is not sufficient to protect amphibian species. So with that, I'm going to look at a couple of the questions that have come in. And if you have any questions, please send them in. And then I'm going to return back to telling you about the research that I did for my uh, PhD, which will probably take more than 20 minutes. I'm happy to go after our one hours up, as I often do, because there's always a lot to talk about when it comes to amphibian conservation. So one question was, are these imported animals all caught in the wild? And we didn't have an answer for that, but I doubt it. I'm sure that plenty of them are farm raised, especially if they were American bullfrogs, which are raised in at least 15 countries outside the United States and are one of the primary frogs used for food all around the world. So there's probably some that were caught in the wild. I know a lot of frogs destined for the pet trade, unfortunately, are removed from the wild. Specifically, I was in Colombia in April and May, and I know that's a big problem with the poison dart frogs being taken out of the wild. Bullfrogs are imported into California each year by the millions, many of them from farms. Uh, we have upcoming Save the Frogs Academy class all about the bullfrogs. I think it's two weeks from today, September 25th. And uh, Save the Frogs has already gotten legislation in place in Santa Cruz City and County to prohibit the importation, sale, and purchase of American bullfrogs. We are working on uh, the entire state of California. One question, <clears throat> how long can chytrid fungus survive without the host? So it can certainly survive on live amphibians. I know it's also been found to live on dead snake skin. And <clears throat> I have to assume it can survive seasons. It can probably survive until the next uh, springtime comes around. It can survive the winter if it's wet and it has keratin to live on, which snakeskin does, and many, many other animals produce keratin, then the chytrid fungus can survive quite a while. And I don't have that precise number, but I know that there's a paper from the Spear Lab in Australia by Megan Johnson that talks specifically about this. So maybe one more question. Okay, I'm going to continue. I'm going to go back to my slideshow. So give me one moment, please. All right, back to chytridiomycosis in Australia. For anyone just joining us, I'm Dr. Kerry Krieger, founder and executive director of Save the Frogs. And... I went to Australia in 2003 to do my PhD learning and finding out more all about amphibian declines and extinctions and what, when I arrived in Australia, I did not have a specific plan of what precisely I wanted to do my research on. But I knew that chytrid fungus was causing a lot of trouble and we did not know a lot about it. So that quickly became the focus of my research and within three months of getting to Australia, I was out in the field sampling frogs for chytrid fungus. So a little bit more about the specifics of the chytro, chytrid fungus, Batraca chytrum dendrobotitis. It has a very short life cycle, four to five days, and can release 150 zoospores. So if you do the math, something that can reproduce every five days and multiply itself by 150 has high potential for rapid exponential growth. All available evidence suggests the fungus is transported to distant locations. By that, I specifically mean intercontinentally via human activity. Pet trade, food trade, laboratory trade, zoo trade are the five main reasons that people are shipping amphibians. And upon arrival in a naive frog population, that means a frog population that has never been exposed to or evolved with the chytrid fungus individuals, or individuals are likely to have no evolved defenses against it. Therefore, 
it's brand new and they can easily die from it. So here's a case study from El Cope, Panama that was done by Karen Lips Lab. And they had been out in Panama studying amphibians and they had seen rapid declines happen to the north, northwest, throughout Central America from Mexico down through Costa Rica and the countries in between. And eventually uh, they were in Panama. The amphibians were doing great, but they sensed that the chytrid fungus may be moving in a southerly path based on the pattern of extinctions over the past 20, 25 years that had happened in Central America. So they did a lot of sampling and they sampled over 1,500 individuals of 59 amphibian species and found no chytrid. And they also did not see dead frogs. In Oct between October 2004 and February 2005, a five-month period, they noticed drastic population declines, extirpations, found 346 dead frogs from 38 species and seven families. So all of a sudden, frogs were no longer as abundant and they were seeing dead frogs all over the place. They sampled 318 of those dead frogs and found that almost all of them were infected with the chytrid fungus. There was no population recovery and to this date in the high mountains of Panama and Costa Rica, where many of these declines took place, there has been very little population recovery. So assuming the population did not go completely extinct, even if a few frogs remained, they still have not rebounded their numbers to historic levels. And there were no cofactors known to be involved. That means they did not detect any pesticide deposition, any drastic climate changes or other things that could have caused the sudden decline. So what this says to me is that chytrid by itself, when it arrives, can cause drastic, uh, essentially decimate an entire amphibian community. So we need to know about the chytrid physiology. Hydric requirements, it needs or it has waterborne zoospores. It reproduces with zoospores and those zoospores need water. They cannot survive desiccation, which means if they dry out, then they die. Thermal requirements of the chytrid fungus, it prefers cool temperatures. In the lab, it does best from 17 to 23 Celsius. It can survive freezing. That means it can live over winter in the high mountains. It's been found as high as, I think, 5,000 meters in the Andes in South America. But it cannot survive above 29C. That's about 84 Fahrenheit. Once it gets that warm, it does not grow well, and it will potentially die. And these are likely to be important factors with regards to the distribution of the fungus and its effect on various amphibian populations as amphibians live, some of them in cold places, some of them in hot places, some of them in dry places, some of them in wet places. So when I started my PhD in 2003, the host parasite ecology of chytridiomycosis was poorly understood because there had been few large-scale systematic disease surveys on wild amphibian populations. Most of the chytrid work that had been done before then was essentially random sampling of amphibians. People would see an amphibian, catch it, test it, and then try to dry, draw conclusions. <clears throat> but that's hard to do without proper experimental design, meaning perhaps some of your amphibians were tested in the winter and some in the summer. Some were from one species and some were from another species. Uh, some were from ponds and some were from streams. And there were so many factors involved that it was pretty much impossible to figure out why the prevalence of the disease or how infected they were was changing. So what I wanted to do was... Um, fix the problem that there was little empirical evidence to explain what limits the distribution and abundance of Batrachochytrium dendrobotitis. And help explain why the disease can vary even between 
conspecific amphibian populations living at disparate locations. That means amphibians of a single species. Why is chytridiomycosis affecting them differently? So within a single species, such as in northeast Queensland, where there were about four species that disappeared from their high altitude uh, habitats, but persisted at low altitudes. Even within a single species, there was a difference in how they were, in how the populations were being affected by chytridiomycosis. So, for an overview of my PhD research, I aim to determine how the prevalence and intensity of chytrid infections vary with season, with altitude, with latitude and with breeding habitat, and to determine the effect of chytrid infection on survivorship of frogs from a non-declining frog populations. Not all frog populations experience declines when the chytrid fungus comes to town. So I'm going to go into each of these different aspects of my PhD uh, research. First, let's uh, define some terms. Prevalence is the proportion of animals infected. So if I sample 100 frogs and 30 of them are infected, then we'd say the prevalence is 30%. Intensity is the parasite load. Specifically, the number of chytrid zoospores that were detected on the animals or specifically on the sample taken from the animal. So prevalence is a percentage of how many are infected. Intensity is telling us how infected were they? Did they have one zoospore on them or 100,000 zoospores on them? And I sampled about 3,000 frogs during my PhD time, and that would entail catching a frog with a plastic bag so that I'm not touching the frog, I'm not spreading diseases to frogs, I'm not um, affecting my results by perhaps putting chytrid on lots of frogs and then ending up thinking that the prevalence was high when in reality, maybe I had infected frogs. So I wouldn't do that. I would catch them in a plastic bag. I would only touch them with a glove. And to get my sample, because chytrid fungus infects their skin, it infects keratinized cells, which on adult amphibians means their skin. I would swab them in a specific um, manner that I actually have a video on our chytrid fungus page all about how to swab a frog with the highest chance of detecting chytrid on it and doing it in a standardized manner. And I'll show you that video in a bit. So I would then take the swab back to the lab and do PCR, specifically quantitative PCR, which I'll explain Basically, if the frog had chytrid on its skin, then when I swab it, some of that chytrid would hopefully end up on the swab, and I would test the swab for chytrid fungus. So what PCR is, polymerase chain reaction is pretty much the basis of all modern-day uh, molecular biology. PCR was discovered, I think, in the 1980s and has pretty much revolution, revolutionized biology. Anytime you hear about any work that has to do with DNA, it's probably using PCR because we start out with only a small amount of DNA and it's too small for us to work with. We need more DNA. So what we do is heat the DNA molecule, which splits it into two separate strands, and then we attach nucleotides to each of those strands in the precise order, as was the original molecule, which means the genetic code is maintained what was one DNA molecule becomes two. So we've doubled the amount of DNA. And then we repeat the process 50 times, which makes billions of DNA molecules. So if chytrid was in there, if there was only one DNA molecule of chytrid, all of a sudden we'll have billions of it. And then we have enough to actually work with in the laboratory. I specifically use quantitative PCR I strongly encourage anybody doing chytrid work in the lab, if they're testing for chytrid, they should be using quantitative PCR whenever possible as opposed to conventional PCR. 
as my work demonstrated, uh, that quantitative PCR is much more effective at detecting the chytrid, and it gives us twice as much information because instead of just getting a positive or negative result, quantitative PCR allows us to know how infected the frogs were, how much chytrid was on them, how many zoospores. So we get double the data. So if you do all that work in the field catching frogs, you may as well double your data. Okay, so quantitative PCR <clears throat> takes a fluorescent dye and attaches it to every DNA molecule. A laser shines on the sample and the brightness of the fluorescence is measured. The sample's brightness is compared to that of a known quantity of chytrid zoospores, and a computer then calculates the number of chytrid zoospores present on the sample. So essentially what's happening is if chytrid DNA is present in the sample, the fluorescent dye will attach, and the more fluorescent dye attaches, the more chytrid is present. So the brighter the uh, response, essentially, the more chytrid is there, and we compare that to a known quantity of chytrid to tell us how many zoospores are present. So that's how I'm telling if chytrid is there. And we have to do that because it's very difficult to tell if a frog has chytrid with the naked eye. It's not very um, good idea to assume that you can tell if a frog has chytrid. You pretty much have to do um, molecular work or histology, but histology is um, more problematic because it requires taking skin from the amphibian, which can cause them harm. Okay. <clears throat> Before I continue and tell you about seasonality study, we've got a few questions that have come in. Do I think biologists play a role in the expansion of the chytrid fungus? As I said, I would always catch frogs in bags, use a glove. At the same time, biologists are traveling around. Biologists are in the water, going to different streams, going to different catchments. Is it possible? Yes. Is it one of the main reasons? Probably not. Are there other sectors of society who also use streams and hike around? Yes, hikers do. Probably tens of millions of hikers. Fishermen do. Anybody who drives across water in their four-wheel drive and keeps on driving. Yes, there are tons of ways that humans can spread the chytrid fungus. But is that as significant as shipping 100 million amphibians overseas, far from their original destination. I don't think the main problem is from biologists, though yes, as I said, it is a possibility. So it's something that people should consider. Okay, so back to my one of my studies, which was on seasonality. My question was, does the prevalence and intensity of chytrid fungus vary significantly throughout the year. And my hypothesis was that infection levels would be highest in cooler months. And I thought this because, as we said before, chytrid fungus prefers cool temperatures. Amphibian immune response is lowest at cool temperatures. And in one study, 50% of the dead and dying frogs that were found in the wild in Australia were found in the winter. So here's what I did. I worked with the Stony Creek frog, Latoria Wilcoxi, which is a widespread and abundant frog in Australia that's often found on rocky streams, especially streams that have some amount of sunlight coming in. They don't have lots of canopy cover. And this, I thought, was a good species to work with. Because it's so widespread, it's been implicated as a reservoir host. And that means that if it does have the disease, chytrid, and it's so widespread, then whatever's happening with chytrid in this species, those disease dynamics likely affect many other species because this one is so widespread and abundant. So I sampled a one kilometer transect of the Narang River in southeast Queensland. I returned there every six weeks 
from April 2004 to January 2006. And I attempted to find 30 adults each time I went, 30 adult frogs to sample. I also put a data logger at ground level 10 meters from the stream. And this was measuring air temperature every 90 minutes. And from that, I could collect data over that entire 19 month or so uh, period and look at the mean air temperature in the 30 days prior to sampling. And here's my results. So in Australia, the seasons are reverse from the northern hemisphere. Basically, what I was finding was a lot of chytrid in the spring and in the winter, and not a lot in the summer and autumn. Springtime comes, it's cool, frogs have chytrid, they're all out there breeding. Summer comes along, things warm up, maybe even kills off a lot of the chytrid. So that by the end of summer, start of autumn, sometimes on two occasions I went out there and did not find any chytrid. So this was up to as high as 58% prevalence in the spring and zero in um, the summer autumn. And how's that relate to air temperature? Significant inverse relationship. What I found was that when it's cold, there's a lot of chytrid. And when it's warm, there's not a lot of chytrid. Above 19.4 Celsius, um, there was, heh, sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue, sorry. Zoospores in season. So how many zoospores did I find in certain seasons? When it was cold, some of those frogs had about 10,000 zoospores on them. And in the summer and autumn, those frogs were having, you know, maybe just 10, 20 zoospores on them. So significant change in the number of zoospores with season. And if we look at zoospores versus air temperature, as I said, this was the mean of the 30 days before I sampled. When it was cold, 12, 13 Celsius, we'd find 10,000 zoospores or so on the frogs. And when it would heat up 20 degrees or so, that's down to one zoospore, 10 zoospores, uh, very, very low. So the warmer it got, the less infected the frogs were. Summary infection levels highest in cooler months and drop significantly by late summer, which means that past surveys undertaken in summer months may have severely underestimated chytrid prevalence, may have missed detection altogether. So if you're sampling in the summer or in the warmest months, then there's a high chance that you will miss chytrid altogether and get some flawed um, results and conclusions. So if you're looking for chytrid, ideally you should be sampling when the 30-day mean air temperature is less than 19.4 C. Survivorship. So this was a different study. I wanted to know what are the mechanisms by which prevalence decreases in the warmer months. Are infected frogs dying off, leaving only healthy individuals? So perhaps lots of frogs are infected when it's cool. And then all the infected frogs die off so that by the time we resample in the summer, we're only finding healthy individuals. Or perhaps the frogs themselves are able to overcome their infections, meaning maybe in the springtime they're all infected. By the time summer comes around and I show up to sample, a lot of those frogs just had the proper immune defenses to ward off their infections, just like if you get a cold, you probably won't die from it. A couple weeks later, maybe a week later, a few days later, you'll be healthy again. And in a non-declining frog population, such as these Stony Creek frogs, does chytrid affect the frog survivorship? How long can an infected wild frog live? In the laboratory, usually when frogs are dying from chytrid fungus, they die about 30 days after being infected. What's going on in the wild? So in that same study as the seasonality study, 
I was individually marking frogs so that I could tell which frog was which. And then I would recapture frogs on subsequent visits. As I said, I was going there every six weeks. So some of these frogs were being resampled and I was able to con construct infection histories. So here's the results. Seven adult males that initially tested positives eventually tested negative. At one point they had infection and then I went back in the future and I did not detect chytrid on them. So we know that wild frogs can clear their infections. That's good news. The infection status generally track the seasons. That means that in it was those frogs in the in the winter they'd have the infection and then in the summer they would be without the infection within an individual frog. And one frog lived at least 103 days after I initially detected its infection. It could still be alive, who knows. But all we know is it lived for at least 103 days. So we know that wild frogs can clear their infection and that they can live longer than that 30 day period that usually kills frogs in the lab. So were the uninfected frogs more likely to be recaptured than were infected frogs? 18% of inf infected frogs were eventually recaptured and 18% of uninfected frogs were eventually recaptured. So no clear trend there. There were plenty of frogs that were not infected um, that were recaptured. Uh, what we see here, the takeaway here is that above, I think about 4,000 zoospores on a frog, there was no frog that had over 4,000 zoospores on it that I ever recaptured. So I, ca I recaptured plenty of frogs that were, we can say, mildly infected. But any of the ones over 4,000 zoospores on them, which we'll call strongly infected, I never saw those frogs again. So likely at some point frogs can handle, or at least in this species, the Stony Creek frog, they can handle their infection and perhaps survive. But once it gets over a certain infection load, in this case about 4,000 zoospores, I never saw those frogs again. Maybe they survived, maybe not. So I found no evidence that chytridiomycosis was negatively affecting adult survivorship, which suggests a few possibilities. Chytrid-induced mortality in this population is generally restricted to metamorphs and juveniles. Maybe chytrid is causing a big problem in this population. But if it is, it's probably just in the metamorphs and the juveniles, which I did not test. I was only testing adults. Adults seem to be doing fine. Or this population was not exposed to conditions that favored lethal disease outbreaks. So when I was testing this population, the adults seemed to be doing fine. But maybe every few years something happens. Maybe there's a big climatic change. Maybe some other disease comes in as well that causes synergistic effects. Maybe um, pesticides come or who knows what happens. And perhaps I just happened to be there when all the conditions were good enough that they could survive with their chytrid fungus. Alternatively, this population has evolved sufficient resistance to the disease to persist relatively unaffected. That would be great. Hopefully frogs can evolve resistance to chytridiomycosis and do just fine with it. Okay, before I tell you about my altitude study, I want to check out some of the questions that have come in. And if you have questions, go ahead and send them in. Okay, so I'm going to continue for now. I'll, I'll take a look at these questions uh, at the end of this. All right, for my altitude study, my question was, 
Does the prevalence and intensity of chytrid infection vary significantly with altitude? And my hypothesis was infection levels increase with altitude. This, of all my studies, <clears throat> when I started my PhD, I thought was the most definite to that it was so definite that this would be correct. That infection levels must increase with altitude because in the high mountains of the world, that's where most of the rapid declines were and are occurring that it's assumed to be from chytrid fungus. So I assume this would come out correctly. I was surprised with some of the results. But I thought this because chytrid fungus prefers cool temperatures, amphibian immune response is lowest at cool temperatures, and the declines in southeast Queensland and worldwide are generally restricted. The rapid declines are restricted to high altitude populations. And chytrid's been implicated as proximate cause of these declines. So here's what I did. I had altitudinal transects looking at three stream breeding species, Latoria pearsoniana, Latoria chlorus, and Latoria wilcoxi. I went to three different catchments in southeast Queensland, Narang River, Conungra River, Mary River. Mary River catchment is the home of the former southern day frog and southern gastric brooding frog, which are both now extinct. On each of these transects, I examined 100 frogs, or I aimed to find and sample 100 frogs of a species over an altitudinal gradient from 90 meters to 885 meters, which is basically the tops of the mountains in that part of the world. And that may seem low, but chytrid fungus did or is thought to have caused problems in those mountains, specifically in the high altitude areas of those mountains. So for that part of the world, it should be high enough. So I had eight altitudinal transects, if you look at the different species, and the N number on the right is how many individuals I sampled of each of those species in that transect. Some of these places I returned to in the spring and summer, as you can see with the Narang River, and I repeated some of these transects in multiple years so that we could see are the results consistent across a year. My results, 37.7% of nearly 800 frogs that I sampled were infected with Petrachochytrum dendrobotitis. I found infected frogs at every site I went to. I only found two dead frogs during the entire study. One was positive with 669 zoospores and one tested negative. They did not get complete postmortems. So this is just the results from the chytrid swabs that I took. Prevalence results. Chytrid infections are widespread at all altitudes in southeast Queensland. There's no consistent evidence that infection prevalence increased at high altitudes, contrary to my initial assumption. Prevalence increased with altitude on two transects. Prevalence decreased with altitude on two transects. And there was no relationship between chytrid prevalence and altitude on four of the transects. With respect to the intensity of the infection, how many zoospores were on these frogs? Again, no consistent evidence that the intensity of frogs' infections increased at high altitudes. The intensity increased with altitude on two of the transects. There was no relationship between number of zoospores on frogs and altitude on five of the transects. One had no sufficient statistical power to make a conclusion. So here's the results. Each dot represents a frog. Specifically, how many zoospores were detected on that frog? And what we see is that regardless of the altitude, there were infected frogs at all altitudes, and even the number of zoospores on them varied widely. Even at the lowest altitude, we found frogs with over 10,000 zoospores on them. Same thing at the high altitudes. There was no repeatability of the results between year one and year two. Between spring and summer, we got varying answers. And if we look at the air temperature, I had five data loggers taking air temperatures every 90 minutes or so at five different altitudes in the Narang catchment. 
So this is all air temperature that we're seeing. Now, only about 0.4% of the air temperatures read above 28 Celsius, which is the temperature above which Kitra just does not grow very well at all. So essentially, in the Narain catchment, where I did a lot of the sampling, the temperature is essentially always perfect for chytrid fungus to be growing, whether you're at the low altitudes or the high altitudes. So in some sense, it's not a surprise that we found chytrid all over the place, even though declines happen in the high altitudes of southeast Queensland. What about stream temperature? Stream temperature was always between about 13 and 23 C, which is perfect, again, perfect growth temperature for chytrid fungus. Regardless of the altitude in southeast Queensland, chytrid finds a good place to live. So summary, there was no consistent evidence that either the prevalence or intensity of the chytrid infection increases with altitude in subtropical frogs. This was taking place in the subtropics, and these results are difficult to extrapolate to temperate regions or tropical regions. So the question is, is the chytrid fungus the sole causative agent of high altitude frog extinctions in southeast Queensland? And if so, why didn't any low altitude species go extinct? And a important point is subtropical frogs likely find no thermal refuge from the chytrid fungus. If you're in the subtropics, then chytrid can do a great job living there. So if conditions do change and favor the chytrid fungus as opposed to the host, then there can be lots of problems for subtropical frogs. And as we've seen in the past, subtropical frogs can go rapidly extinct in all likelihood from the chytrid fungus. Latitude study. My question was, is the chytrid infection non-randomly distributed across the latitudinal gradient? And my hypothesis was that frogs further from the equator, that means it's cooler when you're further from the equator, they would be more likely to be infected and would carry more severe infections. And also that chytrid infection levels would be highest at cool sites with high rainfall. As we said, the chytrid fungus needs water to survive. So here's my methods. I went to 31 sites from Mossman Gorge all the way at the top. That's number one in Northeast Queensland, the wet tropics, as they're called, down to Eden, number 31, near the border of New South Wales and Victoria. This covered 2,315 kilometers and over 20 degrees of latitude. I sampled 863 adult male Stony Creek frogs. One species, all adult, all male. I averaged about 28 frogs per site. I only sampled in lowland areas between 25 and 195 meters altitude. All sites were east of the dividing range, which is the mountain chain that runs along eastern Australia. And I did all the sampling in a six-week period from September 2005 to November 1st. 18 September 2005 to the 1st of November 2005. So all this was important to me, as I said at the start of this presentation, prior to my PhD research, most of the chytrid sampling and studies that had been done were essentially haphazard random sampling of frogs. I tried to remove any sense of randomness from this by sampling all adults, all males, all one species, all in the lowlands, all east of the dividing range, and all in one single season. So that if there are changes in chytrid prevalence and intensity, then we could draw um, conclusions from it. More about my methods, climatic analyses. I got 30-day rainfall data from the Bureau of Meteorology. I measured the stream temperature at the site around 7 p.m., and call that sunset water temperature. I measured the snout vent length for all frogs to determine their size. I found that over, sorry, 20% of the frogs from the study were infected. 
the prevalence of chytrid infection at the sites varied from zero to 70%. Some sites had no chytrid. Some sites were had frogs where 70% of the frogs were infected. Chytrid is widespread along the entire east coast of Australia. I found infection at 24 of 31 sites, including the sites at the northern and southern ends of the latitudinal transect. No dead and dying frogs of any species were found. So here's prevalence versus latitude. And what we see is a slight increase as we move to the south in prevalence. It's not statistically significant, but close to it. And here's a good place to reiterate my belief that quantitative PCR is what people should be using if they're testing for chytrid, not conventional PCR. Because if we had had conventional PCR, this would be the extent of our data. We'd have no statistically significant conclusion, and we'd wonder what's going on. But because I use quantitative PCR and was able to test how many zoospores are on the frogs, we can see that at the southern end of the transects, those frogs had on average 10 times as many zoospores as did the frogs at the north. So they were 10 times as infected as we moved to the south. And there was a statistically significant increase in the intensity of infection as we moved away from the equator. Prevalence versus sunset water temperature. What we see is that as the water temperature gets warm, we get significantly less chytrid. All six sites with sunset water temperature above 23 Celsius had no chytrid fungus. Once it got over 23 degrees, we did not find chytrid at the sites. Prevalence versus rainfall. Statistically significant increase in prevalence as we got um, into the wetter sites more rainfall, more chytrid. And what we see is that above 33 millimeters of rainfall in the past month, all the sites had chytrid fungus. Below 33 millimeters, only half of the 14 sites had chytrid. So dry places, less chytrid. Wet places, more chytrid. And zoospores also significantly increase in wetter locations. Something interesting I found in this study, as I said, I was measuring the length of the frogs. There was no relationship between snout vent length and latitude. So northerly frogs, southerly frogs, it didn't really affect how big those frogs were. Temperature at the sites didn't seem to affect the size of the frogs. Rainfall didn't affect the size of the frogs. So I was wondering, well, what does affect the size of the frogs? Prevalence of chytrid fungus affects the size of the frog significantly. So what we found was that the bigger the frog, which may mean the older the frog, the less chytrid prevalence they had. And, uh-oh, give me one second to, uh-oh, PowerPoint died. So I was nearing the end of my stuff, the end of everything anyway. Basically what I found was that um, big frogs had less chytrid and there's several reasons for that. Let's, uh, let's see. I'm, because I'm over time anyway, and I think that was my final study, I'm not going to continue with the PowerPoint aspect of things. Um, let's say, send me in your questions and I'll try to answer them. If anybody has a question and would like to be unmuted, and you'd like to speak into your uh, mic and ask me a question, then go ahead and raise your hand. Otherwise, I'll look at some of these questions that have come in. And I just want to summarize my research by saying, I guess one of the biggest scientific questions is the fact that I didn't find any clear relationship between altitude and chytrid fungus. And there's been some other studies from around the world that have asked that question. What, how is chytrid fungus prevalence changing over altitude? 
And there's conflicting results from there as well. So that's interesting. And the other major um, point for future needs is the need to change the way that humans are uh, handling amphibians and shipping them all around the world with very little regulations, quarantines, disease testings, or generally speaking, awareness, lack of an awareness, lack of thought of the implications of what we're doing, and how do we prevent the future extinctions and drastic population declines of species based on our um, actions and the way that we're shipping amphibians all around the world. And so now I'm going to look at a couple of these questions and then show you a couple of the things on our site resources on the SaveTheFrogs.com website and some of the um, programs we have related to the chytrid fungus. Okay, so someone who I will take a guess, or I'm not even sure, but they write in saying that the U.S. GS and the U.S. FWS, Geological Survey and Fish and Wildlife Service, have decontamination protocols for equipment that are followed in the field to avoid spreading chytrid, ronavirus, and other possible diseases. And Southeast Park Partners in Amphibian Reptile Conservation have guidelines. There's also a um, published scientific paper, I believe by Lee Skerritt, that discusses ways to for scientists to decrease their risks of spreading disease. And we've already discussed that um, aspect before. One question, if I want to test for frogs, if I want to test frogs for BD, I need a control. Where can I get it? And it has been very difficult to find the chemicals and the chytrid controls to do testing in your own laboratory. And I actually don't have a good answer for that because over the past five, six years since I did my own testing in my own laboratory or the laboratory of Griffith University in Queensland, Australia, where I was, I had a source that I got in 2004 and it basically lasted throughout my PhD for chytrid controls. But with the increase in people around the world wanting to test, that source was unable to continue distributing or certainly not easily. And I've never heard of a new easy place to find chytrid controls. So I don't have an answer for you on that, but I do. Um, I will show you what we have going on on our website that can help you testing for chytrid. And I'll get to that shortly. Let me look at some of these other questions coming in. Is it possible that Karen Lips unintentionally introduced the fungus into Central America in 2004? No, that's not possible because chytrid fungus was in Central America as early as the 1970s. So that's not, not what happened. Is chytrid fungus sensitive to UV light? Yes, I'm pretty sure that in the Megan Johnson paper I referenced earlier that they do discuss UV light as a way to kill the chytrid fungus. But if you're referring to increases in UV in the Earth's atmosphere and how is that affecting chytrid at high in high mountain areas, uh, there's controversy related to UV's effect on amphibians in general. How is it affecting chytrid? I don't think it's killing off the chytrid in the mountains because we know that mountains are where the chytrid fungus is living most throughout the world. Not necessarily in southeast Queensland. What happens to amphibians in the winter in temperate zones? I'm not sure exactly what you mean. In most places, the amphibians go live under a rock or a piece of bark and wait out the winter. And... So in the winter, they're not necessarily going to be at the water. They're not going to be breeding and touching each other's skin as much. So even if the amphibian is there, sorry, if the chytrid fungus is there in the winter, it's probably doing most of its damage in the springtime when all the amphibians are at the water and are breeding and touching each other a lot. 
Oh, so let me uh, test one more time. I just, unfortunately, just saw a, uh, um, that we do have Peter Jenkins potentially on the line. He may not be here anymore. Peter, if you're there, I can unmute you. I'll actually unmute you right now and see if you say anything. Oh, let's see. How about this? Peter, if you're there, just uh, raise your hand and we'll see if we can get you on the line. Peter's been working with that Lacey Act um, petition that we heard about earlier. So some more questions coming in. Okay, so there's a question related to ronavirus, which we did not talk about much other than saying it's another disease of amphibians that causes problems. And the question is, with regards to the lack of info on the ronavirus in Africa, do you think a master's thesis might be a good way to fill this hole in the scientific knowledge? Now, I'm not sure. I don't know anything about what we know about the ronavirus in Africa, but this brings up a bigger issue of do we need more information on diseases and how would we use that information? So my question would be, even if we filled a hole in the scientific knowledge about ronavirus in Africa, how would that knowledge be used? And every person who's doing their master's or undergraduate research or PhD or postdoctorate research or professorial research should always be asking themselves, okay, if we get more knowledge about something, that's great. It's great to have more knowledge about things, but how will it be used? What we heard earlier is the difficulty in getting legislation in place. So, um, you know, the question always becomes, how will you personally use that information to further amphibian conservation, which to me, solely publishing something in a scientific journal and calling it done, it's not done. That's only a starting point. Once we have that knowledge, it needs to be used for a purpose. And if it can't be used, then there's other things more important to work on. So, I'll just leave it at that and let people ponder the implications of that statement. Now, there are people, okay, somebody, well, I won't even go into this. Controls, can you purchase them? Maybe. So if people still have questions on controls, go ahead and email me. You can always email us at contact at savethefrogs.com. My email is carrie, K-E-R-R-Y, at savethefrogs.com. And maybe I can give you some more information on controls. Do you have any estimates of when Kittred entered Australia? As I said before, December 1978 is the first known record of Kittred in Australia. And uh, I'll give a disclaimer in that I'm, I created this presentation five or six years ago and I have not been keeping up with new records in Australia, and perhaps there's been an earlier record. The more we look, the more we find. Okay, so I will say, because he wrote in three times and seems quite certain of this, Pisces Molecular may be able to provide controls for PCR. I'm sure that they will charge you, but you could look there, P-I-S-C-E-S, -E Pisces Molecular. And with that, I seem to have answered most of the questions that have come in. Let me test one more time to see if we have Peter on the line. And it doesn't look like it, unfortunately, but for perhaps for a future Save Frogs Academy class, we will get him back here. So I just want to show you uh, our website. We have a page, savethefrogs.com slash kittred is the easiest way to find it. Otherwise, what you can do is go to the homepage of our site and 
right up at the top, you'll see threats to frogs. Click threats to frogs. One of those threats at the top is infectious diseases. So you can't get to it too quickly unless you just remember savethefrogs.com slash kitrid. And on this page, I talk a lot about um, kitrid, including some things that I didn't discuss today. I definitely recommend everybody right at the top, go read the letter that I wrote to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as one of those comments regarding the Lacey Act. It's a 15-page letter that answers a lot of questions related to chytrid fungus and why it's so important that we do have proper regulations related to the chytrid fungus that the Lacey Act could solve a lot of those issues. And on that topic, I just want to remind everybody, Susan said this before, the Lacey Act controls the shipment of injurious wildlife into the United States and across state lines. It does not control anything that has to do with what you would do with an amphibian or the chytrid fungus in your own state. If someone wants to raise frogs, sell frogs, ship frogs, release frogs, unless it's in violation of their state laws, then the Lacey Act has nothing at all to do with that. So yeah, I have a lot of information on this page about chytrid fungus. And one thing is um, a video on how to swab a frog for chytrid fungus and back to testing for frogs, qPCR. Um, I'll get to that in one second. I just want to see what else is on this page, if there's anything else I wanted to discuss. This slideshow that I just gave is in slideshow format, more or less exactly how it is, that you can look at just the slides on there. And again, a video of this class will put up to youtube.com slash save the frogs. Okay, so at the top of this page, there's my detailed protocol for the detection of chytrid fungus using qPCR. Click that link and you'll see that in 2009, I gave a five-day course in Spanish to 25 amphibian biologists from Panama, Colombia, and Costa Rica. That took place at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. And what we've put on this page is my detailed protocol for detecting chytrid fungus. So on this page, there's lots of info. If you want to detect the chytrid fungus, then you have access to the precise protocol, word for word, that I used during my PhD research to sample about 3,000 frogs. There's a slideshow all about doing qPCR detection of chytrid fungus. You can watch that slideshow. There's some other materials, and then you can actually download the detailed protocol that step-by-step, step, every single step that I did is in there. So you'll have lots of information there. And other things related to what we do um, for chytrid fungus, there's the Lacey Act um, issues. There's American bullfrogs working to get them uh, to get the importation of bullfrogs stopped in California. They're not a native species. We know that they're spreading diseases. Working to educate people about how to be responsible pet owners so that they're not spreading diseases. And you can see we have a page about pet frogs. If you go to our sidebar, there's um, pet frogs. And let's see, that's, that's all that I'm going to say for now. So you have plenty to think about for Kittred. Savethefrogs.com slash Kittred is your one-stop shop for Kittred information. And a final chance to send in your questions. If you have any more questions, send them in. If you want me to unmute you because you have a mic and want to ask a question live, then go ahead and raise your hand. So a question came in. Do these diseases form in amphibian terrariums if they are not clean. I wouldn't say that diseases form in terrariums, but if a disease is introduced because you bought or acquired an infected frog, then you could easily introduce the disease into your terrarium and potentially kill off every amphibian in your 
terrarium and future amphibians that enter your terrarium. And if you dump the water in that terrarium out into the wild, you could then introduce that disease into your backyard and those amphibian populations. Question comes in, will the recording be available on the webpage? Yes, I will embed a video of this video. Sorry, I'll embed a video of this class onto the Kittred page and always on youtube.com slash save the frogs. You can find videos. We currently have about 40 videos up there. A lot of amphibian conservation knowledge on our YouTube page. We also have, if you scroll down, you will see, will you see it? Let's see. It may not even be linked to, but we do have savethefrogs.com slash video is another place to find our videos. Do you have specific evidence linking chytrid outbreaks to importation? Can you trace strains of BD, from, which is Batraca chytrum dendrobatitis, from one continent to another and link it to a contaminated shipment? Jonathan Colby was on the line earlier, and he was finding chytrid fungus in imported shipments of amphibians from different continents, so that's a definite yes. Do you have specific evidence linking chytrid outbreaks to importation? Now, this would entail tracking a frog from a farm, maybe in Taiwan or China, following that frog to America, following its importation, following its entry into some shop in America, and then it being shipped to maybe you and into your terrarium, and then watching the water get dumped out into the wild, and then tracking those amphibians to see if they get infected with that strain, and then they die off. So that's what I take specific evidence to mean, which is just perhaps not possible, but definitely unnecessary. All we need is logic. We find imported frogs. 30% is what Jonathan said he's seen. 30% of the frogs in his shipment were infected with chytrid fungus and other diseases. And we know that people dump their water out into the environment that the amphibians were in. We know that people release pets into the wild because they didn't know any better. We know that frogs escape. We know that when a hurricane comes or some tornado or natural disaster and smashes your house, hopefully not your house, hopefully not anyone's house, but it can smash houses and buildings and shops to pieces and wildlife or trapped wildlife gets free into the environment, it gets out there. If we're importing it in, it's going to get into the environment. There's no way around it. You can't ship 100 million amphibians around the world and expect that none of those amphibians and none of the water they were held in goes out in the environment. So I'll say yes, evidence and logic links chytrid outbreaks to importation. Chytrid fungus, we know from genetic work, is spreading around the world, and we know it from logic, we know it from looking at the numbers, and to think otherwise is to be extremely dangerous in how we deal with chytrid fungus. If we're always searching for more and more and more evidence, it's, not, it's just not necessary at this point. We know how chytrid spreads, so I hope that answers your question. And it sounds like all the questions have come in, so I thank all of you for being on the line. And I'm going to call that a day. Oh, no, all for anyone who's still on, and I thank you for staying on this very long class. I hope it was very informative. I just want to let you know that, oh, there's something else here. I have a page savethefrogs.com slash Kerry Krieger you can check out or anytime anywhere on the site you see my name click through to it or at the top of the Kittred page you can see articles by Save the Frog founder Dr. Kerry Krieger click that and you'll get a list of all my published papers on Kittred fungus with downloadable PDFs 
So there's a huge source of free knowledge for you. Learn all about the studies that I was talking about in their published format. And another thing, super fast, Save the Frogs Academy, as I said, takes place where we give free online classes every Sunday at 5 and every Wednesday at 11 a.m. California time. So please join us. Coming up Wednesday, sorry, coming up this Sunday, Brianna Bender, who's been helping out with Save the Frogs for about four years, will be talking about how to organize events, rallies, protests, any type of public event, like even a 5K race in your city, and get a lot of people to show up to learn about the frogs. A week from today, I'll be talking about how to volunteer for Save the Frogs. If you want to be a volunteer, if you want to start a chapter in your country, your state, your school, you should be on the line. September 22nd, we're going to be talking all about our efforts in Ghana. September 25th, we'll be talking about American bullfrogs and the city of San Francisco's illegal draining of Sharp Park wetlands and subsequent killing of endangered California red-legged frogs and San Francisco garter snakes, which are also endangered. And we also have October 2nd and 13th, we'll be talking about the mountain yellow-legged frogs, which are critically endangered. October 9th, we'll have a special session that's especially for teachers and how they can get their schools involved in amphibian conservation. We have the International Day of Pesticide Action coming up October 12th. We'll be live at the Wildlife Conservation Expo in San Francisco, October 13th. If you're an artist or a poet or no artists or poets, our Save the Frogs art contest and poetry contest are coming to a close October 15th. So I'm going to end it there. Thank you very much for attending Save the Frogs Academy. And my name is Dr. Kerry Krieger, founder and executive director of Save the Frogs. If you like this class, if you like Save the Frogs, if you want frogs to survive and thrive, I strongly encourage you to donate to Save the Frogs, savethefrogs.com slash donate. And also, you can become an official member of Save the Frogs by clicking right on our homepage, join Save the Frogs, become a member today. I'm going to end it there. Hopefully, you'll all donate and become members so that we can keep giving lots of these educational classes. And thank you very much. Have a great day. Bye.